Hello everyone, uh, this is the Decaturish.com Twitch Forum for DeKalb County School Board District 4. I'm your host, editor, and publisher Dan Wisenhunt. Uh, our guest today is incumbent school board member Allison Gewertz, who is running for re-election in the May 24th election. Allison, how are you? You're on mute at the moment. Thank you. Hi, Dan. I'm, I'm okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for hosting this today. Thank you. And uh, her opponent is Bonnie Chappelle. Uh, I have not been able to reach Bonnie Chappelle. I've tried several different ways. She did not respond to our Q&A. Uh, our policy is we move forward with the forum with the candidates who show up. And as you're about to find out in a couple of hours, uh, we're going to have a forum where no candidates show up. And I'm just going to read the questions. So stay tuned for that, uh, Hoot Nanny. Uh, so we are going to start, uh, just kind of go through the questions that I have. It, ordinarily, I would keep time, but since we don't have any other candidates here, I'm just going to let Allison talk. Uh, if you have a question for her, though, go ahead and uh, create a Twitch account, uh, put your question in the chat, and we will try to get to that question. Uh, also, you can send your questions for her to editor at decaturish.com, and I'll be able to get those emails while we're talking. So, uh, Allison, why don't you give us a quick opening statement, and then we'll roll into our questions. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just say again, I'm thrilled to, to be here. I think it's very important for the public to be able to hear, especially given the recent events of our district, you know, what, where, where we stand, um, what we believe in, um, what our goals are moving forward. So um, I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that you're not getting the response from my opponent and, um, and the other candidates for board seats. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Obviously, my um, focus has shifted a little since I, I filled out your questionnaire, which was a lot about um, goals and reasons for running um, that I still hold dear. I mean, I'm, I'm running because I put students first. And um, and I, I believe that this district has so much potential um, to move onward and upward and keep the focus on children. Um, I've had to remind myself of that mantra many, many times over the last week. Um, so yes, I'm running because I, I want to continue to put students first. I wanna to continue to be as transparent as possible, communicate with the community, be a financial steward, put forward, new strategic ideas um, for our district to move us into the future. And, um, and I'm excited for the opportunity um, to serve and to be here today. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And uh, we're excited to have you here as well. Um, we're excited when any candidate shows up to this forum. So it's a, it's a good thing when people do. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you uh, having the guts to show up and answer our questions. So thank you for that. Um, my first question, uh, specifically to you as a board member, is who, in your opinion, is responsible for the condition of Druid Hills High School? Is it the superintendent? Is it the board? Who? Where does the blame for that lie? I feel, so I learned a lot about this. I ran the Splost 5 campaign in uh, 2016. And um, I learned a lot about the history of our facilities and um, this problem that's at Druid Hills and at, and at all of our schools is decades in the making. This is not something that has just popped up in the last two weeks. Um, <clears throat> what happened, my understanding is that historically, when, the, when SPLOST was started, the original like SPLOST 1 was started, that um, a lot of the decisions for funding were made based on which board members had power, which board members yelled the loudest about what was happening. It was very political. And um, several iterations of SPLOST happened in that way. So that's my understanding of why there has not been equity historically in the, in the upkeep and condition and funding in our in our buildings is because it was there was not an objective way that this process was done. SPLOS 5, the reason that I think SPLOS 5 passed by the greatest um, percentage in the history of, of East SPLOS and DeKalb is because at that point there was a commitment to do a SPLOS list based on objective criteria. So the district did bring in experts to walk through every building 
figure out what needed to be done, um, prioritize and hand that to the board. And that is what guided the board for SPLOS 5. It was flawed. I mean, we certainly know that there are places where constituents and buildings say, why wasn't you know this leak on that facility condition assessment? Um, so I won't say that that was perfect, but it was a very noble attempt for the board at that time to be objective with our buildings. What we found from that objective assessment of our buildings is that we're in way worse shape than we realized. We actually had at the time, and I think this number has grown, $2 billion worth of need. And SPLOS 5 was expected to uh, generate 500 million in funding. So there was no way that all of the projects at the schools needed to be done. And as we know, Druid Hills is one of the schools that was on the SPLOS 5 list. Um, a lot of the schools that, are, that we're talking about now in reference to the Conference of Master Plan and SPLOS 6 also were identified as having problems in SPLOS 5. So this problem has been longstanding. What's happened recently is um, in anticipation of SPLOS 6, and because of the lessons learned from SPLOS 5, the Board of Education made the decision to spend $2 million on a comprehensive master plan. That comprehensive master plan was supposed to get at both the, the facility conditions again, figure out where what needs to be done where, and also, a strategic sort of vision for our buildings as a whole. Our, a lot of our problems, as, as you know, have to do with overcrowding and underutilization. And the facility condition assessment doesn't always get at that. Um, the facility condition assessment doesn't always get at the things like at Druid Hills, there's, I mean, they, they suspect that that terracotta sewage system underground that was built for one building can't handle six buildings on that Druid Hills campus. We suspect that, but that's not something when they're looking at the buildings that they are able to assess. So there are things like that that we wanted the experts to do to get a big picture about um, what we should be doing with our buildings as well as the condition of our buildings. That's what the comprehensive plan was. That has, that has been completed. It was done with massive amounts of community input, multiple town halls. Um, all the board members were talking to their community members and recommending community groups for the um, comprehensive master planning team to talk to. So we were able to say, hey, you know, there's a group, for example, there's a group called Los Vecinos de Buford Highway that's really tapped into the community there. Why don't you go talk to them about some of the issues at Cross Keys? And they would do that. Um, so it was a very robust process and it, and it gave us a pretty solid plan. What they told us was, these are, these are our recommendations. You will need to take some of our recommendations and figure out how they work for you. The three biggest examples of that were the early learning centers, the K-8 concept, and the consolidation rebuilds. Um, they, the reason that they said we would need to flush that out is because there are a lot of um, subjective measures that go into those kinds of plans. And, you know, the like, does it make sense for the K-8s? I'll just give an example. Does it make sense to have one K-8 in each cluster or a cluster of K-8s? Their recommendation was we try K-8s because there's re that's research-based, K-8s are working in other districts in the nation. But in terms of how we do that, we still have to figure that out. Um, with the, with the, with the consolidations, they said the same thing. Like we can tell you on paper financially that tearing down very old decrepit buildings and building, taking two of those and building a new building makes sense on paper, but you need to figure out your priorities in terms of, um, you know, the personalities of the schools, the programs they offer, the feeling of a small community, those kinds of things that are hard to put in objective terms. Um, when they looked at Druid Hills, they said that, um, that there were some major factors that to them made more sense to do as a modernization 
than as a series of basically, you know, smaller capital investments, like a, a plumbing replacement here, you know, fixing pipes here, that, that kind of thing. Um, they said, we recommend this modernization because we think these problems are bigger. We think that you have a safety issue. If you're familiar with Druid Hills on the right side of the building, there's just this teeny tiny passageway with kind of a right angle behind it. And their cars have, regular cars have trouble getting behind the building. So emergency vehicles cannot get back there. There's not a way to get a, an emergency vehicle back there. They said to us, we feel like that's a safety risk and you're gonna need to move that building. Um, that's why they made the recommendation of the, it was 52 million. I think it went up to 60 million upon further evaluation. That's a high number. That's a higher number than many of us expected it to be. That is more in line with a partial teardown rebuild, which in fact it is when, when, when they were asked, they said, yeah, basically it's a teardown rebuild. There are all these buildings and some of them can can't stay and are going to have to be torn down and rebuilt. Um, that all of those problems, the community will tell you. I've been in that school, you know, multiple times over the years. Those those problems have been there. What what changed was this idea of doing a major overhaul fix rather than a bunch of quick fixes based on the facilities plan. So it's been a long time coming. Um, the other point I'll make just about the modernization is that we can get 75% reimbursed based on the state criteria for modernization reimbursement. So that I, I'm guessing we didn't talk about, I don't, I did not talk about that or here in a public forum, our Perkins and Will CMP team talk about that aspect, but our operations team and the people that I've talked to getting information from the state have indicated that depending on the space to be renovated, like as academic spaces um, are eligible for 75% reimbursement, which means the state's paying for that, not uh, that's not coming from our SWAS money. So, you know, it, it's possible we could come out paying close to the amount we'd be paying for multiple systems replacements anyway, but we didn't, obviously we don't, we don't, we haven't had a chance to explore that. I, uh, at the board meeting, I asked if we could get a second opinion on that, um, just to be sure we're clear that we really do need to move a building and go underground, do the sewage system and all these things that are making the price so high. So um, I had thought the, the Department of Education would be our second opinion. And I haven't seen a report from the team that came out from that, but I'm still hopeful that, that that when we get a report from them, that it can help us figure out exactly what we, we need to be doing at, at Druid Hills High School. But long-winded answer, but it's been many, many, many years in the making. And it all just, you know, as you know, came to a head. A, a, like basically in the last few months, it's all come to a head. So who's responsible? Is that the board's responsibility or is that the superintendent's responsibility? I would say it's a it's a governance team responsibility. The governance team is the board and the superintendent. We best practice for for governance teams is to work together to further the strategic plan, the strategic goals of the district. We added this was before the superintendent came. We added a goal area to our strategic plan that is specific to facilities. So our current five year strategic plan. We have six goal areas, one is facilities. And we spent a lot of time talking to the superintendent before she came, when she got here all along about how important it is to do our facilities. We also said to her, we are doing a comprehensive master plan and we expect that that comprehensive master plan to guide us. So we gave that directive about the strategic plan. We, we work with her uh, to, to implement the strategic plan and the comprehensive master plan. So, so both of us need to move that forward. She was trying to move that forward when in February, her staff brought us the modernization for Druid Hills. The modernization item for Druid Hills that she brought to us did not tie us 
to any funding. It didn't bind us to doing the project, nothing. It just was, if we, if we do, in fact, follow our comprehensive master plan and do a modernization down the road, we'll be able to be reimbursed because we've given the state a heads up, we're gonna need that reimbursement. That's all it means. So I feel like she was doing the job we asked her to do by bringing us that, that item at the time. We derailed it. So we, we, we blocked that in February. We blocked it again this month. So we blocked her from doing her job. We weren't working in concert as a team with our superintendent the way we're supposed to. So it's both of our responsibility. But in this case, I feel like she, she in my opinion, was doing what we had already asked her to do, and then we blocked that progress. Why did the school board block the progress? Why did the school board prevent her from doing what you had already asked her to do? Well, I've I've tried to get that question answered myself. To be honest, I when it all happened, it was a surprise. When it happened, I I went into that meeting, I guess two Mondays ago, um, expecting that we would problem solve this, that we we would come together and problem solve, there had been a hint that, that there was a group of board members that had talked um, over the weekend about some different plan. I was not a part of that. So when I came to the board meeting, I'm sensing a theme here, actually. I think the same thing happened to me Tuesday. Um, so I came to the board meeting. Um, I had put a lot of thought into um, what, I, what I really thought was best for students um, in this case. And uh, as I, I think I've said, I, like my mantra, I keep a card in my bag at all times that says students first. I mean, I really try hard to do that. And I thought, okay, I think the way to solve this problem is to um, get a second opinion on, on the Druid Hills project, because I hear, I hear the concerns, even from um, families in, in my area, I, I don't technically represent Druid Hills. There were people that said, why did that price tag for Druid Hills pop up that much? Do we really need to spend that much money? Well, we can get a second opinion on that. I asked my colleagues in other districts and they said, oh yeah, we've gotten a second opinion. We've used, we have on contract inspectors that, that I mean, you have to pay them, but they'll come give you a second opinion. So I thought, okay, like we can get a second opinion. So we feel confident in that project. So that was thing number two, one. And thing number two was, um, I thought, and I've said this before, this is not new, new for me, but I thought our needs are over $2 billion for our buildings. We have buildings that are, that do have the same problems at Druid Hills. I and mean, there's, there are several, I invited the whole board to go on a toilet tour at another school to show how their sewage backups and plumbing problems and the digging that need to be done, done underground at that school, like how immediate those, those needs were. So there, there, I'm well aware that there are other schools that have these problems. I'm also well aware that SPLA 6 is not going to generate enough money even if we do, which we are, we're applying some of our CARES Act money to HVACs and roofs to, to knock some of that out, even with some of the reallocated plus six money for those, I mean, five money for those projects. It's not enough. Like it's a very clear revenue problem. And our SPLOS, our penny that we get from sales tax is never going to give us enough to do that. We're not Gwinnett, Cobb, Atlanta. They have a lot more businesses that are generating pennies for them. So that's why their schools look so much better and their East Boss programs generate so much. We're never going to have that. So in my opinion, this is, again, not the first time I've said this, we need a cash infusion, a big one. And I, I proposed at Monday's meeting that we float a GO bond in November this year. Um, for a big amount, at least probably $150 million, so that we can immediately do both what are what the, the big priorities that our CMP told us we need to be doing, the, the top priorities of our facility fixes, which the, the district is very committed to. And, and that's those are the capital investments in, in systems like the plumbing, uh, electrical, those kinds of things. Do that and 
go farther and take some of those projects that have been put off until SPLA 7 and get some of those done right now, immediately, like basically fast track everything so that we can get, get more done. I went to the meeting expecting that we could have a discussion about this, how to meet the needs of the kids at Druid Hills, how to meet the needs of the kids at all the other schools that have these problems. It's, it comes down to money. How do we do that? That's something that's in our purview. We, we can decide that we want to flow to GeoBot. We, we decide, we approve this loss lists. Um, so as you know, um, I think you watched the meeting, uh, none of that got any traction because there already had been a plan. There was a plan that a subset of the board was behind that took the, the modernization motion off completely off the table and substituted it with a completely different motion that um, in my opinion, through the conference of master plan and the priority projects on there of note, the new Sequoia middle and high school um, into question. So, um, so that is sort of what, what went down with the Druid Hills project and why it's hard for me to answer the question of why, because I don't know, I don't know what led to that moment. I only saw how it went down in the moment. And, and I also asked in the moment for more time. I said, can we, can like, this is a, this is an interesting proposal um, from, from my fellow board members, but I haven't seen it. I wasn't aware of it. It's, it was several pages of a document that was read. And I said, can I have time to process this? And we can talk about it at our scheduled three o'clock, April 26th called meeting. And, um, and the answer was no. It needed to be voted on right then. So I, I, I think you would have to ask um, those colleagues about that decision making because I, I can't answer that question. So you propose floating a bond, which is a you know valid mechanism for fixing schools. My question is: the district has a two billion dollar budget. Uh, according to Superintendent Richard Woods, the district apparently has millions in federal relief money from COVID. Uh, relief that they haven't spent. So the district apparently has quite a bit of money. Why hasn't that been spent fixing the buildings? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, that money, um, that money is being spent to fix the buildings. It's a, it's not, it's a, it's a process. So, I mean, we have to bid the work and figure out that like, uh, this is something that I've learned about recently. Apparently, there's a way that you can um, more efficiently address system replacements by grouping them multiple school by grouping them. So if there are seven schools that all need HVACs, there uh, it, it sometimes can be more efficient to have them all priced and all done a, as one big seven HVAC project rather than individual bidding and assessments at every single uh, school. So some of that is what they've been working out at the um, at the last East Boston Advisory Committee meeting. They the um, interim COO said we have 27 schools that we're. I assume it's the grouping. I don't think he went into detail about the grouping, but that we're um, putting forward for CARES Act funds. And they have said all along that CARES Act funds would be used to prioritize the systems that are most related to the to the pandemic and the concerns we had from the pandemic. And I heard the most concerns about HVAC, lots and lots of concerns about HVAC. And then we also have a lot of concerns about, about our roofs. And so those are the ones that they prioritized for CARES Act funding. That's been in the works the whole time. The superintendent has said, I mean, for at least a year that we will be using CARES Act fun funding for that. It's just a matter of figuring out which schools and how to group it and how to efficiently get it done. We also have been spending our CARES Act money on multiple, there's a, we have a website um, that, that breaks down our spending in CARES Act money. We know that there are deadlines for spending. So the, 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 it's the S or one, two, and three, there are deadlines for those. And we know right now that we have until the fall of 2024 to get that spent. The superintendent did a zero-based budget last year 
they're doing that again this year where they start at the local school level building the budget they build it up and then the team figures out which of those needs work for cares act funding so last year there were a lot of cares act programs um, and initiatives that were that were baked into the budget they're doing that again this year they're doing the same thing there are also things that come up during the school year that the superintendent has brought to us for CARES Act funding. Sometimes those initiatives have been blocked by the board. The superintendent has recommended, this is one of those things that worked, works for CARES Act funding. It's tricky to, so CARES Act fund, funding is a little bit tricky because it has an end date. So we don't necessarily want to do a lot of hiring of long term, you know, staff that we would want long term because we don't have a guarantee for funding long term. So what what makes sense is more short term, like if they're like like any grant works, like br bring someone in for two years or three years to do implement this program or do professional development for our staff on this program or put in the technology infrastructure to make this program work so that when the funding stops, the people leave, it's still in place for us. And um, so there have been opportunities for us to use CARES Act funding. Um, some have been approved for the board, some have not. We, I'll be honest and say the superintendent had the intention to have more spent by now, except for the board blocking some expenditures. So some of that, that also falls on, on us, um, to be honest. But I do, I will assure the community that money is being spent. There are plans for that money. There, there's a transparent tracking for that money. We, we get updates on that money. Our updates have been um, blocked as well lately. We haven't been able to receive a superintendent's report at the last board meeting or at this past Tuesday's meeting, but oftentimes she'll give us an update on CARES Act when she's able to give us a superintendent's report. So that money, that money is being spent. I don't believe that um, we have a problem with that. Uh, we, we're getting it spent. We know we can use it on buildings. We are using it on building systems replacement. It is in progress right now. You say that. You say the money's being spent, but there are multiple schools across this district that have well-documented and numerous problems. Why? I mean, if the money's being spent to fix the problems, why are there still problems? Well, I'll say part of the reason that there are still problems is because um, there's a, we have a staff shortage within facilities. So some of the things that we could theoretically do ourselves, I mean, well, some of the problems are maintenance problems that our team could fix, but we can't hire enough people to, I mean, there's, we, we all know this, anybody who um, <laughs> lives in any kind of structure, apartment, home, whatever, knows that um, it's very difficult to get a plumber. It's very get, difficult to get an HVAC specialist. I mean, it, we, we, we are having trouble getting um, carpenters. I mean, we, we're, we're internally having trouble hiring, so we can't keep up. Then when we're trying to contract, um, we're finding that there are the same delays that, that uh, again, like I, I, as a homeowner, when, when I need something fixed at my house, they'll say, okay, I can get you on the schedule in June. I mean, it's not like we can snap our fingers and have the labor that we need to get these things done. So when I say we're spending it, we're trying to spend it, we have plans to spend it. Um, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. We, we do know that it's just, we, we have to wait for the labor. We have to wait for the materials, like the roofing materials, the, the HVAC parts. I mean, there, there are backlogs and backlogs and backlogs and we can't, we can't get what we need. So, um, so I, I mean, I, I feel like we, we should have done a better job of preventative maintenance. We should have done a better job staying on top of all of this. We did not. We're sorely behind. We have horrible problems, but there are pandemic related um, difficulties that are making it very hard for us to get this done quickly. And that is not just in DeKalb. I, this is another thing I've spoken. I've been very frustrated about this myself. Part of it is again, because I have this 
history of advocacy around facilities. And I have talked to my colleagues in other districts and in other states, and they've said the same thing. Like we can't, we're having trouble getting our money spent on these same things because we can't get the labor. We can't, some places they can't even get people to come give them bids on projects. So um, it's a big problem and I, it is our responsibility and we're trying to fix it. And I'm not trying to blame the pandemic. I'm just saying the pandemic has exacerbated this to the point where it's very, very frustrating. The school district hasn't had a permanent HR director since Cheryl Watson Harris arrived. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Uh, w would that make it harder to acquire the labor you need to move on some of these projects? Would that make that hiring process more difficult or, or no? Um, I would say um, having a, a solid HR chief would make a difference probably in all aspects of hiring. I, I think there's there's a lot we all we know this there's been a lot um, of concern about our HR division for many years well before the superintendent came. So ha having a strong HR department, a strong chief, I think would help with all of the hiring. Um, I, I, I would say that there are people that I've talked to in districts that have stronger HR departments than we do, and they're still struggling with hiring. So I, so that's one of those things where, yes, I think it would help. Would it solve the problem? I don't think it would solve this particular problem. It's a, it's a problem everywhere. Why hasn't the superintendent been able to hire uh, an HR director within the last two years? Has she not put anyone forward? What, what is the reason she hasn't been able to hire an HR director? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll just say, um, that, um, it's the superintendent's job to, um, fill her cabinet positions and, um, it's the board's job to have oversight and approval, but not micromanage that process. Um, we are, the board is supposed to, um, you know, make sure that there's not some glaring problem um, with a candidate that would tank our district and, you know, bring, bring us shame, but we're not, it's not our hire. Like these, these, these positions, um, directors, executive directors, cabinet level, these are not our employees. The superintendent is the only one who's our employee. So if she makes a hire, that is not great we hold her accountable we don't dictate to her who who to hire who not to hire this is in my opinion we um we empower her to do the best she can with the team she puts together and then we hold her accountable for outcomes like our our is our hiring better are our students achieving better is like we're we're responsible for monitoring the outcomes the accountability of of we're not supposed to be um trying to dictate the hires. Um, that's pretty much all I can say about that. I don't know that my, that everyone shares that same view of what our responsibility is. And I think um, in not just this realm, but in many realms, the superintendent has been blocked from doing what needs to be done to move the district forward. That's kind of all I can say about that. Uh, we got one more question pertaining to facilities, and then I want to move on to a different couple of different topics. Uh, sure. Reader asked... Uh, recently, DeKalb County School District was highlighted in a White House fact sheet for using CARES funding to improve the ventilation in school buildings. DCSD reported this on social media. An open records request revealed that only improvements made by DCSD is that 15 of 170 buildings had their air filters upgraded to MERS 13. What else is being done to improve the ventilation systems in school buildings and to ensure safety of the school community? uh in anticipation of the next covid wave that's a that's i th i feel like that question sort of dovetails with the hvac i mean our we have really old hvacs um we know that um they did upgrade my understanding was they made sure during the pandemic that all the filters were upgraded to what the industry standard was i can't remember the numbers um off the top of my head. My understanding was that it was upgraded to what it needed to be, but our HVAC systems are like, even when the filters are what they need to be, we have failures 
you know, we still have failures in the systems because the systems are old and not functioning correctly. So, you know, the filter ends up not quite being as relevant when you don't even have a functioning HVAC. Um, that has been a concern for everyone. That's not, I mean, our full board, our superintendent, you know, uh, everybody has been very concerned about that, which is again, why HVACs were prioritized. And that's, that's why that's where the, that money, the CARES Act money is going. That's why the reallocation of SWAS 5 money is covering some HVACs is my understanding. And that's why SWAS 6 has, I believe if we can't cover them all with CARES and SPLOS 5, we'll also have HVACs. And that's just that we're working on that, um, that funding right now. And that hopefully should um, not only address the air and the filter issue, but actually our teachers can teach with, um, with the proper regulated temperature in their classrooms, which would be phenomenal. Uh, we're going to move on from facilities related stuff. I appreciate you taking time to answer these questions in some great detail. Um, the school district has a reputation for being vindictive towards its critics. Do you think that reputation is deserved? And if so, what would you do to change it? Well, um, I'm, are you, so when you say it's critics, are you meaning, um, for like internal stakeholders, external for stakeholders. For example, we had a candidate on at their last forum. Uh, she she started a Facebook group uh, for safe return to DCSD. According to her, an administrator from the school district infiltrated the group, took screenshots, uh, and there were uh, consequences for the teachers that posted about their safety concerns. For example, uh, you know, I think what the school board did. Uh, on April 18th with Druid Hills High School is a pretty prominent example of that. Uh, rather than uh, reconsidering their decision to submit the project to get a, a potentially significant amount of state funds, they sort of doubled down on their earlier decision. Um, I heard from several parents uh, that have said, if you speak out against the district, uh, sometimes things happen to your students in the school. Sometimes they suddenly become discipline problems and miss field trips. Of course, that's anecdotal. Uh, I don't have any personal experience to corroborate that, but it is definitely a perception that is out there. Uh, and I think a perception, frankly, that was reinforced uh, by what the board did on April 18th, that the school board uh, has a has a tendency to retaliate against critics of the school district and I want to know if you think that reputation is deserved and warranted and if so what would you do about it okay um I feel like my perception of that uh, like if you had asked me this a few weeks ago I probably would have answered differently um I now it would just be speculation because I I'm 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 still not clear what happened with with the Druid Hill situation. Um, I'm not clear. I did hear about the, um, like something happening with, with social media not being able to post. I wasn't clear that that was related to school, the school district. My, the, the, I, can, I can tell you the, the superintendent, um, Cheryl Watson Harris at the, at the time is definitely not, she was not about retaliation she would never endorse retaliation. I can, I can speak um, unequivocally about that. So um, when, uh, I know. When, when the school board fired Superintendent Cheryl Watson Harris, uh, they moved the meeting to a time where you and Marshall Orson had a conflict. Is that correct? Yes or no? That's correct. Um, notifying them of that, the board did not alter its plans. Is that correct? Yes or no? Correct. You and Marshall have been consistently the outliers on the board in terms of voting against both uh, taking the Druid Hills project off the table and asking for more time to study the repair plan. Uh, is that correct? Yes or no? Correct. Do you think the school board's decision to hold a meeting about firing the superintendent at a time that you and Marshall could not attend was retaliation against your criticism of the board? Do you think it was vindictive towards you and Marshall Orson? 
I mean, that's another one of those questions that's speculation. I, I don't know because I don't, I've asked why. I asked why that day. Um, it seems to me um, knowing, and I, I mean, I did write, it, this is all in writing, that, that um, it was very clear to the full board that both Mr. Orson and I had conflicts that evening. Um, the reason it came up was because of the week before when we received the agenda, which had a three o'clock start time and the documents to go with the agenda, um, the, the documents indicated that it would be a longer meeting than we expected. So each of us individually upon receiving that did write to the full board say, I said, um, this looks great, but I have to get off at five. I'll only be able to spend two hours because we have a district wide event that I've already committed to. Um, and so, and then Mr. Orson wrote a similar email that he was, he was going to get up to have to get off. So clearly they had been notified that, um, that we could not keep going in a meeting. And that was when we thought it started at three and there was a possibility we could get all the business done because the business that we understood was happening that night, which did not include anything like this, um, we could have gotten done within two hours. So that all seemed like it was gonna be okay. Um, it does seem suspicious that the time was changed to 4.45 when they knew my end time was five. Cause I did specifically write, I will need to leave at five to get to this event. That seems suspicious to me. You know, was it retaliation? I don't know. I mean, that's that's speculation. But the fact is, it was changed to a time I had a previous commitment. Um, I I know that I have gotten some questions about the decision that I made to um, to prioritize my prior commitment. And I will just clarify that the reason I, I prioritized that was because it was about students. I had been with students in Clarkston that day already. I had been at a school in Clarkston. I'd been with families of, uh, that were refugees in Clarkston that same day. And I knew that all of our partners from Clarkston were gonna be there for the event that evening. And I had invited other people to attend the event that evening to learn more about how we need to meet the needs of our refugee children. So I did in that moment, I, I, had, I, I did know that something was added to the agenda about five minutes before the meeting started. Um, I found out something was gonna be added that could go um, in, in a direction that, to, in my opinion, sounded foreboding. And I did have to make that decision. I mean, when five o'clock came, I thought, do I do what I've committed to do on behalf of students or do I do adult politics? And I decided to, to do students. And, um, and, and so, yes, it was suspicious that it was set up to force me to make that decision. Real quick, having gone through this this back and forth, do, do you see why people might get the perception that the school board and the district is vindictive against its critics? I understand why they would have that perception, yes. What is your opinion of uh, the leadership of board chair Vicki Turner? Um, well, I've been disappointed, sorely disappointed in her leadership of late. Um, I've been disappointed with the lack of transparency, there's been a huge lack of transparency that I've brought up in board meetings, probably starting in the fall. Um, there were items, and this is this is public. I'm not saying anything that I haven't said publicly and to her, but that there there were items um, we would get the agenda um, and all the items to back up agenda items, and we would come to the board me meeting and items would be removed from the agenda. And there was no conversation about why items were removed, um, no explanation of why they were removed. Um, and I asked at a board meeting, I said, could we have please some transparency because I keep coming to these board meetings and, and items that it looks to me like the superintendent and her team need for us to pass on the agenda are getting yanked and we're not understanding the reasoning behind that. So um, I've, I've been outspoken already about the, the transparency issue. Um, I've also um, spoken out um, personally, there was uh, an issue where I was um, appointed to the DeKalb County Charter Review Commission. 
this would have been in 2019 when the board chair was Michael Irwin. Um, he received uh, the notification that the Board of Education would hold a seat on the DeKalb County Charter Review Commission. Um, he sent an email to the full board and said, we've, our board has received this, who is interested? I wrote back and said, I am interested. He said, great, you've got it. So he sent my name in for the Charter Review Commission. Um, the Charter Review Commission had an initial meeting. Um, that would have been probably early 2020, just before the pandemic. It was pretty exciting. I, I it was a great group of people that I was excited to work with. We, they set up a subcommittee to create bylaws. I was on that subcommittee. I worked on the bylaws for the Charter Review Commission throughout the pandemic. Um, I made requests with my fellow Charter Review Commissioner commission members um, to allow us to have meetings during the pandemic. Um, we were not able to meet, but um, thankfully the Charter Review Commission had the charter extended. Um, that group was able to meet recently when I found out a meeting was coming. Um, I got in touch with my colleagues who said there's a um, an email that's come out about the date and your name's not on it. So that's strange. Um, I, I don't know why that is. I'll see what I can figure out. So um, I started asking questions about why my name wasn't on the distribution list for the Charter Review Commission. And um, I wrote to the board manager and board chair and said, hey, um, this has come to my attention. Um, I, I, I was previously appointed to this. Here's the history. I've been on the bylaws committee. For some reason, I'm not on the distribution list. I believe board chair Turner was on that list. Um, could you please clarify, I need to figure out who I need to reach out to, to fix this. And I was told by board chair Turner, you have been replaced by me. Um, and so I spoke with board chair Turner about that and said, I don't, this doesn't feel like the best decision to me. I've already been on this. I've already been working on this. I'm a person that once I commit to something, I like to follow through. It doesn't seem like it's supposed to be something where the board chair is invited, even if the board chair was invited to make an appointment, that it would be done without the knowledge of the full board of education. And there was never a notification, never a discussion, never we've been invited to do this. So I wrote to the full board and said, you know, I'd appreciate it if we could consider this as a board. I'm happy to vacate the, I, I can vacate the seat if we want someone else to be on it, but I, this doesn't feel right to me. Um, and so I reached out to the board chair about that. It seemed very um, transparent, um, uh, not tra non-transparent, opaque, um, that whole process was strange. So there, I've reached out and um, given my input on things along the way. And obviously I have given lots of input over the last week. I, the, the letter that was sent to the superintendent on, on behalf of the board, we didn't know about either. We didn't, none of, none of us had been consulted on that letter. We didn't know a letter was going out. The way I found out that my board had sent a letter was from a reporter asking me for a response to the letter that I didn't know existed. Um, and of course I wrote uh, about that and said that I hoped that when our board is in communication with our state superintendent that we all have the chance to weigh in or at least be notified that we are taking these steps. And I had problems with the letter that was sent, the letter in my opinion threw the superintendent under the bus and that's not how I would have approached it. I would have approached it as a governance team. We're in this together. Here's what we're gonna to do together. And that wasn't the approach she took. So, um, so I feel like I'm not saying anything here that I haven't said publicly or to her. So I feel like I'm, I'm being transparent, but yes, I've had concerns over the last several months. There are a couple of other times when, I've, when, when policy was pushed through without a first and second read when I asked us to follow our practice of doing first and second reads and not push through policy, I don't think that's a good practice and the, and the, and our board chair has allowed that to happen as well. So there, there are certainly times when I've um, questioned that leadership. Yes. 
Recently, Vicki Turner told the AJC uh, that Druid Hill's high students were pawns of adults. She also suggested that the district didn't need to spend money on Druid Hill's high renovation project because the school, which is a Title I school, is, quote, nestled in the middle of affluence. Do you agree with her statements? No. Okay. Um, do you have uh, personal financial disclosures are forms that elected officials have to file every year that lists their forms of income. Uh, I think they also list property that is owned by board members, elected officials, uh, list sources of income from spouses. Uh, I believe you've, you've been filing yours, correct? Correct. Is it your understanding that school board members are required to file those documents every year? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you, well, I've got another question here from a, from a reader. Uh, it says, given light of recent events and the fact that DeKalb County School District had to pay Rudy Cruz uh, a show prize and he never officially worked for DeKalb County School District, do you think Governor Kemp should come in and overhaul the school board? And I, and I will elaborate, you know, 2013, Governor Nathan Deal did what I would refer, refer to as a hard reboot of the school system. He removed most of the board members. I think some of the board structure was changed. Uh, obviously, the stakes are higher. You, you do have the state superintendent who's uh, gotten involved with this. You've potentially got the attorney general. And uh, Governor Kemp said he is highly concerned about what he's seeing. Uh, do, you think, do you think the state needs to step in here? Do you think an action that drastic is warranted right now for the DeKalb County School Board? I'm, I, I think drastic action is warranted. I mean, I, I feel like there's a, there's a subset of the board acting as the board um, and, and making decisions that are not, they're not only on behalf of the, you know, it's not only that they're not making decisions on behalf of the full board, um, it's that the decisions are, don't appear to be rooted in the best interest of the students. And when that starts happening is when, I mean, my, my opinion has, I've been asked about this by a lot of people. And I've said, if, if, if removing all of us from the board is what allows this board, you know, a future board to focus on students, then please let that happen. And whatever needs to happen, I don't know how, how drastic it needs to be. There may be steps that are not that drastic that can get us back on track. But it's but the, the, the subset that is making decisions that, in my opinion, are not in the best interest of students, that has to stop. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of speculation on how to stop that. And yes, that's one that's one area. And I did, I had a conversation with someone recently about that, where I said just this, if I, you know, I, I'm happy to raise my hand to be removed, if that's what is gonna, you know, make us be student focused, that I'm, I'm fine with that. And the person said back to me, well, that's what happened, you know, 10 years ago, and we're right back to where we were so that means there are deeper issues there's a there's a culture that's flawed that's allowing this to happen and i've thought a lot about that and i've thought well that's true maybe maybe there needs to be deep work um done on this culture maybe all this bubbling up right now will allow all of us our leaders our legislators all of our citizens to do some deeper work on what is going on with this culture that's allowing this to happen in the first place so if we could get at that that would be that would be my my first choice if not then by all means let's have let's have a respite even if 10 years from now we do we swing back let's have a respite from this adult focused game playing for a few years and get people in here who are going to do what's right for students. So I'm, I definitely have hope that there is a board that exists that can do that. I would love for it to be now and sooner if there's a way for us all as a community to make that happen. 
Thank you. Uh, Allison, we're at the end of our uh, time. This has been the Decaturish.com School Board Forum for DeKalb County School Board District 4. Our candidate uh, is school board member Allison Gavert. She is running for re-election. I was not able to make contact with her opponent. I tried numerous ways. I wasn't able to make it happen. She didn't respond to our Q&As either. Um, I, I applaud uh, school board member Gavertz for having the guts to come on the show and answer some really hard questions. It, it's speaks volume so it's appreciated uh allison i'm going to give you about one minute to wrap up and uh to give us a closing statement and then we're going to wrap it up and get ready for the next forum okay thank you thank you again for having me dan in closing i'd just like to say um it is election season and um the i would really love for people to go to the polls uh, whether you're going to vote for me or not we need people to show up we need people to vote in Board of Education elections. This is critical. As you can see, this is impacting our not just our district, school district, but our county and our state. I'm here hearing from state leaders on this. So please, 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 everyone go to the polls, vote. If you want to come talk more with me, I have multiple sessions coming up where I'm making myself available to the community. Check it out on alisongiverts.com. And you can see I'll be all over DeKalb, DeKalb District 4 over the next couple of weeks. So come see me. Thank you. Uh, this has been the Decaturish.com Twitch Forum. I'm your host, editor and publisher, Dan Wisenhunt. All of our coverage is going to be at DecaturishVotes.com. You'll be able to find our voter's guide and other articles about the upcoming election. Election, of course, is May 24th. Early voting starts May 2nd. Again, uh, all of the information about that election and our coverage can be found at Decaturish Votes. Dot com. If you appreciate the work that we're doing, if you appreciate that we send reporters to cover these meetings, if you appreciate that we work to hold our elected officials like Allison accountable and that we advocate for transparency in government, please visit supportmylocalnews.com and become a paying subscriber today. Uh, that money helps us exist. It helps us provide news that's not behind a paywall. It helps us go to these meetings. It helps us pay for open records requests. I got a $300 open records request bill sitting on my desk from DeKalb County right now. Uh, transparency is not cheap. The work is hard, and that is why we need your support to make it happen. We are going to have a school board forum uh, for District 6. That is going to be at 1 p.m. Uh, so far, no candidates have confirmed they have uh, planned to attend. There are three candidates in that race. Two have told me they will not. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to hold that forum anyway, and it's going to be dead air. And I'm going to read all the questions I would have asked. And then I'm going to have a comment, and we're going to wrap up. So I uh, hope you'll join us for that. Uh, it'll be pretty short, I suspect, at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Allison, thank you so much for taking time to join us. Thank you so much for uh, your public service. And uh, we will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thanks.